Hello, everybody. This is episode three of the Lives of Adventure podcast, and I'm your host, Jeff Gardner. In this podcast, we aim to bring you the stories of people that live lives that are a little less ordinary. People who have made the choice to abandon the default path and seek something more. We'll be talking to those who push the limits of human capability, but we'll also be talking to entrepreneurs, musicians, artists, and more. Because to me, there's a lot more to adventure than just risking your life. Really, the only prerequisite for an adventure is to put yourself into a position where the outcome is uncertain. And our guest today is no stranger to uncertain outcomes. He's one of the most inspiring people I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Kevin Tobin is the director of Passages Adventure Camp in Richmond, Virginia, and over the last 25 years has been responsible for introducing thousands of kids to adventure sports and the concept of adventure. Kevin is also an accomplished ultramarathoner and adventure racer. He's a dedicated husband and father. He really enjoys manual labor and somehow seems to thrive when the going gets really tough. In the episode, we cover all sorts of great stuff. We talk about how he got into adventure racing and some of the highlights and the low points of that. We talk about his concept of planned adversity and why it's been such a central theme in his life. And we get into why Passages Adventure Camp is so fulfilling, both for campers and for the staff. But before I give all the details away, I'd rather let Kevin tell you himself, so let's jump right into the interview. Kevin, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Uh, this is obviously a pretty new show. You are our third guest ever, uh, so you should feel, I guess, special in that regard, or maybe uh, as a guinea pig uh, tested on in that regard. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think uh, I think this is going to be a good one. I'm really excited. Uh, as I said to you a moment ago before we started recording, um, it's been a really long time since we've talked, uh, since we've seen each other. So I'm kind of keen to catch up a little bit and uh, ask you a few questions about things that I always wondered and didn't have the guts to ask before. I'll do my best. <laughs> nice. So I suppose uh, I kind of knew of you, well, I knew you initially through uh, working for you at Passages Adventure Camp in Richmond, Virginia. Um, but I suppose I heard about you before that as this crazy guy who did all these adventure races. And at the time, uh, you know, I was whatever, 19 or 20 in college, and I didn't even know what an adventure race was. So somebody had to explain it to me. Um, but I'd love for you to, I guess, one, explain it to the audience real quick, like what the heck is an adventure race, but also tell us a little bit about like how you got into such a slightly esoteric uh, venture. Well, adventure racing is fun because you don't have to be really good at anything, <laughs> which is, that's my specialty. And so an adventure race is, is a race that can be anywhere from three hours to 10 days long. And it's a multi disciplinary race uh, my favorite distance races have been the two to five day where you're it's all map and compass it's paddling and there's a climbing element a rappelling element and mountain biking and running and uh and once the race starts you just you go and you've got to find these points uh all over the maps and typically you have to plot all your own courses and so it's like anything in life if you're if you're doing it with the right people it's the it's the greatest thing in the world. And if you've picked the wrong people to do it with, it can be pretty, uh, it can be pretty grueling, but getting, uh, started in in adventure racing, I was working full time for the YMCA as a sports and aquatics director, but I was coming to the climbing center at night as the building was being constructed. And myself and this guy, Brian Hillard, were just putting climbing holes on the walls. And so they taught me how to use a grigri. They taught me how to tie a climbing knot. And I just got on the wall at night. And we weren't even setting routes. We were just putting holes on the wall. And so we listened to really loud music and uh, kind of talk shop. And I saw an ad for the Mountain Masochist Trail Run in Lynchburg, Lynchburg put on by David Horton. And I cut out that ad and I brought it in to Brian and I pulled it out of my pocket. I'm like, we should do this. And, uh, and he was equally excited and he pulled the same ad out of his pocket. He's like, yes, we should do this. I brought the same ad. (laughs) No way. And so we, I think we had each run a couple of marathons before then, but have never gone longer. And so when we started that race together, we'd committed to do the whole race together. It's like 55 miles long. There's 
16,000 feet of elevation change. It's, it's, it's pretty difficult as far as ultras go. And so we, he, we spent the first couple hours of the race just describing this military operation where we had performed some mission and the only way we were going to get out of this country was to get to this point 55 miles away. And so it was really interesting to to kind of add our imagination to this thing and, you know, is how we wrapped our heads around it. And so it, it put a sense of urgency on on moving even when you didn't feel good, you know, on, right. uh, you know, eating and resupplying and staying motivated and staying focused. And it and it, it worked. So we finished well under the uh, the cutoff time. Uh, Mad. So that's how it all that's how it all got got started. And then, you know, you. Once you do that, you forget quickly how much it hurt, and then you you're like, I you know I could do that again, or what? How can I go bigger? Yeah. And so, and awesome. there's lots of people that go much bigger than I do, but it's been really fun. That's awesome. I feel like there's so much uh, depth in so many of that, like so much of that description there, like so much of life uh, depends on who you're doing it with, not exactly what you're doing. Uh, mm-hmm. Was the first kind of one that jumped out at me there, and then you know putting some sort of purpose or kind of play into the whole situation uh, makes it a lot easier in the sense that, you know, you let your imagination dig on it. And then it was like, oh, actually, we've just got this this game to play. And yes, it's going to be tough. And there's parts that are going to hurt. But, you know, it'll be fine. We'll get there. And uh, I was drawn to the uh, to running ultras because there's you know, I've done a bunch and my goal is, you know, I, I don't wear a watch and I don't, and when I go up to the aid stations, they get the sign, they'll let you know what mile you're at and how many miles to the next aid station. I purposefully avoid eye eye contact with that. So I just, I play this mental game. How long can I go without knowing where I am? And that helps me, uh, you know, enjoy the experience. And I've, I've run a bunch of road marathons where you really feel like you're competing against other people. And the great thing about ultras is, is that, um, you really feel like you're competing against the course. So every single person that passes you on that, you know, on those races, you know, will say, Hey, you know, Hey buddy, you look good. You know, you got enough water, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you need a jacket or something like that. And so, uh, there's a lot of camaraderie in there that I, that I've enjoyed. Yeah, I actually, uh, David Horton races, I think are, you know, I've only run a couple of, uh, well, no, I've only run one ultra and it was a David Horton race, but, uh, they sound like as soon as you go past the marathon distance and you're off road, it like is a totally different thing. Uh, everybody is very, uh, you know, everybody's there to support everybody else to try and get everybody to the finish line or as many people as possible to the finish line. And yes, there's those like pros that want to win, but Everybody else is just there for the experience, which is pretty unique. And it, there's a, a tremendous amount of internal dialogue that takes place over that time. And so, you know, very few people can run the entire course. You know, some of it mm-hmm. is just so steep and so technical that you can't run up it. You can't run down it. So the whole time you're just making deals with yourself. And so you're, you know, your legs are kind of blowing up and you start on this this incline and it's getting steeper and steeper and steeper and and you're saying okay i'm when i get to that broken off tree i'm going to start power walking and then you start power walking as soon as you can kind of see the crash you're like all right when i get to that rock you know that rock outcrop i'm going to start running again and so you just take those big things and and break them into smaller things and the the one of the greatest things about doing stuff like that is when you finish you really feel like you've achieved some lifetime goal like like you've been working at that thing for, for a decade that, you know, cause you're just a wash in, uh, in appreciation of the whole thing. And it's kind of awe inspiring. So yeah, that's actually a fun. funny one. Like we were, just before we started recording, I was saying, uh, you know, in the last year I've run two trail marathons and uh, where we live is very, very steep. There's a lot of elevation. Uh, and so mm-hmm. both races had a ton of elevation gain and loss. And, um, and I think I actually, in the second race uh, about three quarters of the way in, I think I realized that the only reason I was doing that second race is for that feeling that I get about three quarters of the way in when you're like kind of shot and everything, mm-hmm. you know, you're like, I don't know what the chemical mix in your brain is at that point, but you kind of go, ah, oh, wow, this is amazing. It's like being yeah. on drugs almost. <laughs> when you, uh, for me, it's when, uh, when I looked out at my legs and they're running, but I, but I'm not telling them to do that. Like they're, they're just, they're going. So I feel like right. they're taking me somewhere. Right. And, uh, I've got some tattoos on my, uh, on my calves. They're, they're Chinese characters and the kids at camp, 
uh, think that they represent uh, peanut butter and jelly, my favorite foods as a child. Actually, they're you know, one character is great danger. The other is great opportunity. And when those characters, those Chinese characters are side by side, they represent crisis. And so it's kind of a personal philosophy that, you know, life is going to kind of throw stuff at you or you're going to throw yourself at stuff. And, uh, and so with every step there's danger, but with every step there's opportunity. Um, but sometimes when I tell people about those, what the tattoos mean, I just tell them that it's the last things that people see before they pass me in a race. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So then they're stuck wondering for the next like 20 miles, what the hell did that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been at the, at the finish line of, of, uh, you know, these ultras that have a very, um, I, well, I was at a banquet after an ultra and the race director called out the name of someone who didn't finish underneath the cutoff time and, you know, and had this woman stand up and said, uh, what was your finishing time? She's like, well, I finished in, you know, 12 hours and 45 seconds. And he said, well, what was the cutoff? And this is in front of hundreds of people. And she's standing there. And uh, she says, well, it was 12 hours. And he says, did I give you a finisher's medal? And she said, no. And he said, which it seemed harsh, you know, at the time. Yeah. But uh, he said, I have every confidence you're going to train just a little bit more. You're going to come back and you get that finisher's medal. Cause I, but, and I didn't give you one because I didn't want to diminish the achievement of all the people that did it in exactly under uh, that time. So there's, there's not a lot of social promotion <laughs> yeah. uh, in those things. And, um, and it could have potentially be, you know, could have, if he didn't handle it well, could have been a really sticky conversation. But, you know, she got a huge round of applause and, right. uh, and came back and did it. Yeah. It's amazing. So one uh, story that I have relayed to, I don't know how many people I've met over the years and told the story to, but uh, is of you and uh, Mike Stratton, who I lived with at the time, uh, doing a race called the Beast of the East, which was a multi-day adventure race. And I think Mike was 17 or 18. He was young. And uh, it was pretty tough on him. Uh, and I guess, can you just give us a quick recap of kind of what the beast of the East is, uh, and kind of what your memory of that race was? Uh, it's a expedition style, uh, adventure racing, mountain biking, running, uh, rappelling. I think there was rope ascending. There was a ton of paddling and I think it was four and a half days long. And then my wife, uh, was doing support for the race. So she was running around in an RV, um, you know, resupplying us as we went or swapping out bikes and stuff like that. And so, um, I know Michael is tough. He knows he's tough. <laughs> um, I think we had to get a waiver for him to participate and his mom had to sign something for him. I, to I remember that as well. And we did a, we did a team of two and, you know, I had worked with Michael for six years prior to that. And so at the starting line, um, I just turned to him and I'm like, Michael, you're fired. You, you no longer work for me. And, uh, and he kind of looks, he was staggering a bit. I said, I'll, I'll, I will definitely rehire you when the race is over. I was like, but this is, you know, we've got to, we got to get rid of this hierarchy that we've had in this relationship where you, where you work for me. I'm like, we, there's going to be times where I'm going to be a soup sandwich, you know, and the wheels are coming off and I'm going to need to throw the maps at you. And I'm just going to need to follow, you know, in your footsteps and you'll follow in, uh, in, in mine. And so he wrapped his head around that. And our uh, sleeping plan was to sleep, um, was to take a one 20 minute nap a day. And so that the key is how do you, you know, how do you take that nap? when you really need it. And so, um, we, ideally both people feel terrible and then take the nap at the same time. That doesn't always work that way. But the weather was got pretty, was, was pretty harsh. Got, it was really wet, um, for, um, for a while and we were cold and, and, um, he would want to take those naps, uh, at times where if he sat down on the ground, he probably wouldn't have gotten back up and participated in the race because he would have, you just get, when you're, you know, when the furnace is burning, you're nice and warm, but he wanted to do it when we were wet and it was, you know, it was two forty-five in the morning. And so I'm like, all right, I'll give you, you know, I'll give you a three minute nap. And so, um, uh, he would sit down on the ground and I would kind of shed my headlamp on him and I'd make like I was, uh, playing with my watch 
and in like 10 seconds you could see his eyelids were perfectly smooth and <laughs> i would immediately go over and shake him on the shoulders <laughs> even though he'd been only sleeping for 10 seconds and i'm like you feel good man you ready to go and he would wake up you know yeah yeah i'm ready to go i'm ready to go so i i, I think i did that to him four or five times and i didn't tell him what I was doing to him until after the race was over. Actually, when his mom found out, she was very angry with me, understandably. But I was afraid he would get cold and, and not want to, you know, and not be able to continue. Um, so there was a softer and, side. I only heard the mic side of this was just like, Kevin didn't let me sleep at all. <laughs> I survived. It was okay in classic Michael fashion. But <laughs> okay. So it was like, I don't want this guy to die of hypothermia. Okay. I'll keep him awake a little longer. <laughs> And, uh, and it, you know, it worked out and we finished the, uh, the race and, you know, and we had a blast. We, there was a, a, a section of that race where we, ex we expected it would take us 10 hours to trek. So we took 10 hours of food and water and it took 26 hours to do this section. And it was at the end where it was really hot. And we ended up drinking out of like puddles on a dirt road. And, uh, and the only reason we did that is because we, we had agreed that it took a couple days for Giardia to set in and that we would be done with the race by then and it wouldn't matter. Um, but you know, there's, there's something, you know, there's a connection that I have with, uh, with Michael and a, and a few others that I just, I simply don't share with anyone else. And it's with participating in that planned adversity. And there's, there's really, I'm fortunate not to have, so many things happen to me, you know, in life, but I always really want to know where I stand. Uh, so I end up signing up for these types of things uh, with people. And, you know, so he's seen my, you know, seen me at my absolute worst and seen me at my absolute best and kind of ushered me through those times where, um, where me being someone who doesn't normally like to ask for help have had to ask for help. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's, uh, he's delivered. I think that's a really, uh, it's an interesting concept and I've heard it, uh, in a couple of different ways, but like the way you put it, planned adversity, I think that's, uh, pretty important. Like, can you talk about that just a little bit more and just tell us like, you know, when you think about planned adversity, like why would you plan adversity in your life? Uh, you know, my wife, uh, has asked me that a couple of times and I think it was early in our, um, in our marriage that I, that I decided on on what that answer was. Cause I couldn't, you know, I'm like, what's well, fun. It's great. You know, it's, it's, you know, gear and it's, you know, run around the woods, but there's a lot, there's a lot more to it. And so I guess what I've decided upon is that, you know, my, my mom was sick for the vast majority of, you know, my, you know, I th she, um, I think she had, uh, ovarian cancer and breast cancer and, uh, bone cancer and lung cancer. And, you know, so starting at age 12, she got sick and, and, you know, from then on to varying degrees, she remained, uh, sick until she passed. And so I think, um, watching enough of that, uh, somehow convinced me that I wasn't going to live that long. Like you just, when you just, you know, when you, you get a certain amount of your genes from someone and you see them go through that. You're like, well, you know, this is, this is probably what's going to happen to me. And so part of me, you know, is really driven to live, uh, to live fully. And I don't like live with reckless abandon, but to, to live fully. And, um, I can't stand napping. I can't stand sleeping in late. I don't ever want to waste a day. Um, and so I want to live fully, but also I, I, I didn't get the impression that I was going to live a very long time. And so, um, you know, you look at someone like my mom who was as frail as she was, but was unquestionably strong. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't know if I was strong mentally or, uh, or physically. So I think that, you know, as I reflect upon it, um, I had some things to really prove to myself. Uh, and I guess I've partially answered that, but yeah. you know, that the, the question remains unanswered. So I, I keep finding things that, uh, that are challenging. Do you, life, do you think you'll ever answer the question? Um, 
I hope not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if that was going to be the answer. <laughs> Um, I, I suppose that, you know, I'm convinced that if I work hard at something, at, at anything, that I'm going to continue to improve. And I know that there's people that are my age or even younger that are like, well, I'm never going to be that fast again. I'm never going to be that um, that that strong again. But I'm still convinced that, that you know, I can improve and I can be better at something than I ever was uh, before. And so maybe there's a point down the road where I'm not going to be convinced of that, but that's would be hard for me to imagine. Yeah. So this feels like a good spot to transition into, um, you know, passages and uh, what passages is. And, you know, I feel like that that idea of uh, introducing, you know, even a, a little bit of adversity into a kid's life sometimes is a, is a really good thing. Um, and, you know, passages for me, you know, I was never a camper, but uh, I worked two summers for you at, in Richmond. And uh, it was, you know, I look back at it as, you know, two of the best summers I've ever had in my life. So uh, I guess tell us what, yeah, tell us what Passages is first off, and then we'll uh, we'll take it from there. So Passages is an adventure camp that is in its 25th year and was born of a couple of guys, uh, John Willard uh, and Casey Cockrum, who went to camp together and had daydreamed about a camp of their their own. And there was an opportunity uh, in Richmond to, uh, develop a camp that's right on the James River that has access to a quarry and climbing and a spot to zip line and teach kayaking and the James River Park system. And so they uh, they they created this thing and, and really gave it good bones. And um, and so it's grown uh, tremendously uh, throughout the, the years. And there's lots of ways that we measure that success. And, you know, and, and one of the ways and one of the most significant ways for me personally that that success has been measured is, you know, is the fact that I'm talking to you via Skype. You're in another country and uh, you've uh, have a you have a, a full uh, an impressive life of your own. But we've you know, we're talking again about these things that that mean so much to us. So that's, you know, that's a big part of it. Yeah. I think, um, you know, like passages to me, like I never went to one of these long-term summer camps. I went to like Boy Scout camp, uh, which was similar, but not the same. Um, and you know, the idea of going to camp and, and climbing and kayaking and zip lining and, you know, playing capture the flag with, uh, you know, throwing flour at each other across an Island (laughs) is like pretty Robinson Crusoe, pretty, uh, lost boys type stuff. So it it was definitely fun. (laughs) And our, so our, we've got camps for kids that are five to seven year olds. They're, you know, base camp, they climb and play in the bouncy house and swim. And, and that camp is really geared towards, you know, one kind of, you know, indoctrinating these kids to doing things that, uh, are fun and are a little bit wild, but, uh, but are challenging. Uh, but also it's to earn that it's to earn the, the trust of the parents who are not climbers or kayakers or mountain bikers or stand up paddle boarders and, and prove to them that, that we can manage these, uh, situations, uh, well. And, and there was just a couple of years ago, there was a five-year-old girl at base camp who was at the climbing gym and she didn't climb higher than like 12 feet all week. Um, and tried multiple times, but was not able to, to get any higher than that. And that didn't stop us from cheering her on or, or challenging her to go further. And the last day of the week is parents day. And, and she told the staff, I want to climb the 55 foot wall in the back. And, uh, the staff said, well, you know, okay, let's, let's go, let's do it. And so this girl got hooked into the climb and the, our staff belayer watched her, you know, just motor to the top. Uh, of the climb and the parents were aware that their their kid you know was only climbing to a certain height and their their eyes were just welling you know streaming down their face uh, with tears and they lower this little five-year-old girl and she she hits the you know she lands on her feet and you know her parents kind of open up their arms like for a big hug and she she spun around and faced the staff and said how old do i need to be to work at passages <laughs> <laughs> And so the staff person was a little embarrassed knowing what the answer was going to be. So talking to a five-year-old saying, well, you have to be, you know, 14 years old to work at, at Passages. And this little girl pumped her fist like she just got the best news ever. So in just, you know, two more lifetimes, she could apply for a job. Right. At just Passages. nine so years. Our, just nine years away. So our thing has been to 
to establish these relationships with kids at at a young age and really not to let go of them until you know until they become you know engineers and you right. know adventurers uh, of their own so we've got uh relationships that have you know 12 and 15 years old and and have never placed an ad for staff we've always kind of grown our own and and you you joined our program because someone went to college and yeah and said you would be really really good at this you'd really really love it and you'd so love this yeah um, yeah and i was trying to remember that earlier i was like did i even interview with kevin or did i just get like the the carte blanche the pass because i knew somebody and that was it that was the end I, uh i I would uh, go to Virginia Tech and schedule like a dozen interviews in a day at Bodo's Bagels. Nice. Uh, and so I think I think that's where I first uh, I first. That's met probably you. what happened. I'd go there and do interviews all day, and then uh, hang out with uh, the staff for one night and kind of run around. So much fun. So uh, you know, obviously, you know, you're growing your own staff. You are building these super long term relationships with campers, uh, little kids, and things. Uh, you know what? You know, if you had to say, like, what is the purpose of teaching little kids, uh, you know, starting at five and going on through, you know, up to 13 and 14, um, what's the purpose in teaching them climbing and kayaking? Or, you know, just, is it just for fun or is there some kind of underlying meaning to it? We, we've invented our own way of doing these things. There's not a lot of programs in the country that teach kids as young as eight years old to whitewater kayak. And so it's not like we can just look at some other program and copy what they do. And so we, we have, um, a rock and river program and it's essentially our curriculums for, for teaching these things. And there's, there's, you know, all sorts of levels that the kids can progress through. They can go as fast or as slow as they want. And that program, um, started on a napkin at Legend Brewery from a couple of staff uh, right at the beginning of the history of uh, of the camp. So it, it we we started out or the camp started out uh, with the understanding that it was gonna it was gonna find its own way um, of doing things and and some of that's from you know from trial and, and error. But there's staff that um, that you know, bring their own thing to it. When, when I remember specifically when, when you joined the climbing staff, you wanted to make sure that in the rock and river program, that the kids understood who Royal Robbins was. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, you know, some of the peace. pioneers, yeah, some of the pioneers. Uh, and so these things are important. Um, I, I guess I can't say there's just one or two things that make this important because I think that, uh, whenever you do something that looks scary and it's challenging and you're not going to immediately succeed uh, or succeed at all, you know, the, the kids end up assigning their own value to those things. And so some kids, I think, really enjoy the identity of being a, a climber and being a kayaker. Some kids, um, a lot of kids show up at camp against their will <laughs> their parents see <laughs> that they just my kid's a little tender uh and doesn't really spend much time with other kids doesn't spend any time outside what's the what's like the roughest experience that i could most challenging thing i can sign them up for and so we get a lot of kids that that show up at a doorstep that way too but our job is by you know by the end of the week for them all to be you know raving fans uh of these things and so um we like just seeing that the light bulb go on, you know, they just, they just get it. We, they, yeah. they look, you know, they do something that they didn't think they could do and they turn around and look at you like, like you just taught them to read. Yeah. And so now, um, you know, and, and I guess maybe that's a good way to, to sum it up was, you know, when you teach a kid to read, you're unlocking the world. And so when we spend time with kids in these settings and, and help them through their, successes and their failures and their and their fears it unlocks you know the rest of the world that you know adventure is is everywhere even though the city is a wilderness um so that's um, really but cool I, that's i think that's a question that's probably better answered by a bunch of campers than it yeah is, uh, I, that's by me. that's really interesting that it's the value is assigned by the camper and it's going to be different for everybody depending on you know what they're coming you know what angle they're coming at it from and and kind of what experience they take away from it which is cool and julie appleby is our camp 
registrar. She's worked here for 13 years now. And, and after she started working for a little bit, I was like, okay, it's time for you to come to camp for a week, be a counselor in training and experience it. And one of the, one of the things that she said after the first day, she goes, I didn't realize how much crying there is. I didn't think there would be any crying at, at passages. And I said, well, we don't, you know, we don't look at that as a, (laughs) as a bad thing. And when you've got someone that's on the very edge of what they're comfortable with, tears and crying is a perfectly acceptable response to being in that situation. And it's our goal to help them feel so supported that they take a little step past that. We don't want them taking leaps because if you take a leap and it doesn't go well, you take two leaps backwards. And if you take a little step, it doesn't go well. You take two little steps backwards. And so, um, and so that was, that, that was really interesting for her, for her to see. Um, That's amazing. Uh, you gave me a story prompt here about a fainting girl on the zip line. And I just have to ask, because, you know, the zip line is the, the kind of last day type thing. We'd pull it out of the, the lake uh, to keep yeah. it away from all the college kids, you know, during the week, during normal, mm-hmm. you know, normal nights and weekends and things. But uh, I've never saw anybody faint on it. So tell me what happened there. <laughs> Well, she didn't. She didn't faint on it, but she, her parents, made us aware that having their daughter at this camp was in an effort to address a very serious uh, issue that she had with heights. And we know that you know heights and water and public speaking are, <laughs> yeah, are three things that people uh, can really have uh, fears of. And so she wouldn't really get off the climb very much all week uh, in the climbing site. And we have a. a pretty involved and thorough um, orientation for when we do this 350 foot zip line, they travel that distance in 10 seconds, they're hooked into, you know, they're wearing a harness and they're, they're hooked into it with a, with a pulley. And, you know, some kids when they do it for the first time, don't hold on to anything. They're just kind of flying squirrel uh, through the air. And so just in the, in the middle of me giving the orientation for the zip line, she just fainted. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it wasn't too hot. She was perfectly hydrated just, you know, cause I, you know, we do kind of a visualization of that where you like, you sh- shut your eyes and this is what's going to happen. It's going to happen. And so she just, um, you know, she fainted and came right to, and she did a good job visualizing. Yeah. And, um, and so when it came down, you know, we know that for someone who's got real fears or something, they shouldn't go first. And they shouldn't go last. You, you stick them in the middle. And being in that setting, being surrounded by other people, you know, um, if, if if I had 10 staff and her, we would have never gotten her to do the zip line. But because she had all these peers that were doing it and, you know, she it was easier for her to imagine uh, doing that. So we, we finally got her up there and, it, and she was hooked into the zip line and people were cheering for her for 350 feet away. And people who were walking on the trails on Belle Isle are stopping like, what are you yelling at? We're like, oh, you know, this little girl up there, she wants to do the zip line. She's a little scared. So we there must have been like 50 people, you know, just random strangers that were cheering for her. And so when she... Um, we kind of quieted everyone down and gave her some time to, uh, to think. And then she participated in the countdown and she just took a step off that, you know, off that cliff and she zipped across. Um, most of the people that were there had a tear in their eye that she actually did. She's just a tiny thing. And so when, uh, she finished the zip line, I put the ladder up to meet her up in the air and unhook her so that she can walk down the ladder. And I got up to the top and gave her a high five and I, I grabbed the, the pulley uh, to unhook her from the zip line. And she just looked up to me and she says, I'm not afraid of heights anymore. Amazing. And, and you know, and that was it. You know, yeah. she just, she proved to herself that, uh, that, that it was she, fine. she could do it. So. Yeah. That's incredible. Okay. So the other half of the, uh, the camp, obviously there's the campers and then there's the counselors. You've had a ton of counselors go through passages at this stage. What's the craziest, coolest thing, uh, you think you can remember from any of those? Um, I, I can remember, uh, lots of things, uh, <laughs> but you know, first and foremost, like we, so we have 174 staff this year, 90% of the staff came back from last year. I've done 85 interviews, um, for this year's staff for those remaining spots. And so we're completely hired, um, for the summer. And, um, you know, there, there's people out there that don't think very highly of this generation of kids, uh, and, you know, and, you know, I disagree with them. I get to work with, you know, with campers and with staff that, 
that are awe inspiring. And so, you know, all of my eggs are in a basket uh, that's supported uh, and and actually is constructed of 14 to 20 year olds. And so, um, and I don't I don't feel uh, the least bit nervous about that because they're impeccable people. You expect a lot, and 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 they will deliver. And so. Uh, one of the things that we're doing when the river gets low, it kind of opens up opportunities for us to explore different areas. And so we do uh, our version of the lazy river is walking, uh, is putting life jackets on and walking the kids up the trail and then hopping in the river and then floating down through a series of rapids and then doing that over and over again. And so we were setting up uh, safety above and below um, a rapid and making sure the kids were, you know, we could see nose and toes and we're paddling the right line through the rapid. And one of the staff, um, Bridget Fitzgerald, um, uh, yelled down to a staff below the rapid, Katie Sadowski, um, you know, <laughs> Katie, I, I dropped my hat. I dropped my hat. And, you know, with the with the, the, the rapids and the kids, you know, Bridget, uh, well, I'm sorry, Katie couldn't really understand what was going on. So um, the, they're yelling back and forth. And then... Um, you know, Katie realized that Bridget had lost her hat, like it had her her baseball cap had fallen into the river, and that she was trying to get uh, another staff person to pick it up. So, um, so Katie like dove into the the current and grabbed um, the hat that was floating in the water, and and immediately thrust it up in the air to show um, Bridget that she had gotten her hat. Um, but what Bridget was actually yelling was there's a dead rat. There's a dead rat. (laughs) (laughs) She got this huge dead rat (laughs) and it wasn't a possum. It was a straight up rat (laughs) and thrust it up in the air. Um, And I think everyone else realized that it was a rat before, before uh, Katie did before Katie did. That's amazing. That's brilliant. Um, Yeah. There's uh, quite a few random stories like that. I imagine that uh, come up. And, you know, when you, you had referenced, you know, uh, driving uh, vans uh, into, rocks. into rocks. Yeah. And there's, um, you know, I, I've learned that how I respond in that moment with my, the first word out of my mouth and with my tone and with my expression um, guides whether or not people on my staff will um will be open with the mistakes that they make and want to participate in managing them or whether there's going to be uh, an effort to conceal those things. And so there's been, you know, so typically, you know, if you ask any staff these days, what, what, what's the first thing that, um, that Tobin says, if you've broken a piece of gear or you've uh, lost something, if you made some, uh, some mistake. And I usually, uh, I do my best to show a great big smile and I just say, awesome. <laughs> I was, I was uh, turning the trailer around and I, you know, I backed it into this rock that I couldn't see and I broke the taillights, you know, yeah. awesome. Uh, and because if I make it, if I make it any more difficult for them to be open with the mistakes that they make, then, you know, then those things usually compound. Uh, and so I want to, I want to know about those in real time and, you know, and I want them to help participate in, in managing those things. Was I the most expensive error ever? So for the benefit of the listeners, I guess I'll uh, go ahead and just give the quick uh, short version of the story. I was uh, tasked with driving the big camp, you know, 15 passenger camp van off of the island. The island uh, is kind of ringed by this very narrow dirt road. And uh, in places, the ivy is sort of encroaching on the road. And uh, whether I was not paying attention or what, I clipped a very large boulder on the edge of the road with one of the wheels. And it actually, the wheel drove up on top of the boulder, uh, came off the other side of the boulder and very quickly immobilized the van. Uh, <laughs> and it turns out that I think it was the axle and something else that, that I had broken. Uh, and so I had to come find you on foot and then walk you back to the disabled van. And we had to then sort out what was going to happen with the van after that. But that's exactly like you said. I remember very clearly you were like your response, but it was like almost not a response in the sense that you were like, okay, cool. Let's, let's deal with this now. And that was about it. And that, because there's at that point, there's nothing that I could possibly say to you that you hadn't said a thousand times, right. uh, you know, 
in your own head. And, you know, the, the, you know, that's why we have insurance. It's why we've got, you know, gear and we expect those things are going to happen. We just, you know, we've got to, we've got to send our staff and our campers home healthy and happy. And so it doesn't matter what happens at any day, you know, in this program, if everyone goes home healthy and happy, then it, it, you know, it can't be that bad. Yeah. You've sort of done okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Um, so I guess I'll be conscious of the time here. We're getting a little bit late. So there's a couple of questions that I love to ask, uh, everybody, and I suppose you are no different. So, um, what is one thing that you, uh, that you believe that you think that other people think is crazy? One thing that I believe that other people think is crazy. Uh, I, I, I don't believe that happiness is right. And, uh, I, I believe that it, that it's, it's, it's a result of a series of conscious decisions. And so, um, you know, there's, there's things around you that could make you happy right now if you stopped and, and thought about it. And there's things around you that could make you sad, uh, and take away your happiness, uh, you know, if you let it. And so I think that, um, you know, if, if I were to live my life in such a way where I thought happiness was a right and I should be happy all the time, um, I don't think I'd be very fulfilled, but, you know, if I'm making those decisions every day, uh, to be happy and to find ways to be happy, uh, then, um, I mean, that, that's just something that, that works for me. Cool. I like that. Um, yeah, I like that a lot. So, uh, another question, how do you define adventure? Uh, adventure is, is, uh, anything that's uncomfortable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything that's, that's uncomfortable. And so it could be, um, you know, it's an adventure for the Amish to be in New York city, you know, as as an adventure for most of us actually. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, and, uh, uh, I, I guess it, I, I like trying to find uh, comfort in in uncomfortable uh, situations, and so anything that kind of takes me out of my uh, el- element, anything that's you know that's pushing me, and so uh, you know it could be you know it, it's an adventure to strike up a conversation with someone that you know you know with an absolute stranger. Uh, it's an adventure um, taking your bike off of a jump that. Uh, that you've only contemplated in the past and finally have, you know, some the gumption. And so, you know, it can take any form. I think too often it's just associated with, you know, an expedition on some mountain. Um, but you know, adventures absolutely everywhere. We have a, a, we teach primitive wilderness survival, uh, to kids and of all the programs that we have, it's an absolute paradigm shifter because they go in the woods with $1,500 worth of food and all their camping gear. And as they learn to identify things in nature that can supplant the stuff that they've brought, they can take their, you know, they weave a mat. And if they want, they can take their sleeping bag, put it in the van. If they make a debris hut, they can take their tent, put it in the van. If they burn out a bowl to eat off, take their mess kit, put it in the van. And so one of the things we do is, is get them up at, you know, pre-dawn and space them out in this piece of private land that we have. And, uh, leave them there with their journal, no headlamp. And we just, we say, stay here until we come back. Don't move. Uh, and don't make a noise. And so, you know, within the next couple hours, uh, the sun will start to come up and they get to see how the forest wakes up. Like, like what's, what's kind of moving around first and what's, you know, and then you you realize, you know, how much like, you know, you see some deer, but the deer are paying attention to the birds and the birds are paying attention to everything else. And so, um, once the sun is up fully and they've completely loaded their journal up with all these amazing things that they've experienced in the meantime, we're making like a big kind of fancy breakfast, uh, for them by the fire, bring them all together. And then we each have them share what their experiences were, um, watching, you know, the earth wake up and they talk about it. Like it was a religious experience. And, and the point that we try to drive home at the end of that is that there was absolutely nothing special about that sunrise. There, 
nothing unique. There was nothing marvelous. There was no, you know, a thousand things didn't come together to make this beautiful thing. You know, that sunrise has happened every single day that they've been alive, but they've been in bed. They've been asleep. Uh, and so um, trying to get the kids to to see that, you know, if you put yourself in the right headspace uh, and place and time, uh, there's some pretty awesome stuff out there to experience. That's amazing. I actually, uh, a very similar lesson from a, a teacher in high school that uh, used to, there was a trip I did years ago with them and he would try to get everybody up before dawn and he was always, who's getting up at, you know, before dawn, who's getting up to see the sunrise and everybody's like, oh, I'm moaning a bit. And he goes, listen, you can sleep when you're dead. There's only but so yeah. many sunrises you have a chance to see. This is one of them. And it exactly always worked. Right. Everybody was like, yeah. okay, done, fine, great. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> so like, you know, we've talked about a whole bunch of things around, uh, you know, passages and adventure racing and adventure in general. Um, you know, is there anything, you know, if you had one thing to kind of impart on, uh, you know, whether it's a kid or a parent with a small kid or, um, or even just somebody who feels like they've kind of lived a slightly sheltered life, you know, what would be the one thing you'd say, go do right now or get your kid doing right now? That's a tough question. That's a tough question. I think that, um, you know, particularly in social media, uh, things that are adventurous are, they're pretty, um, they're visually uh, accessible. And so um, you can, you can watch videos of people climbing in Majorca, you know, over the ocean um, and kayakers doing 102 foot waterfalls, uh, you know, in their boats. And, and w what I don't want is for people to be scared because of that. It's, it's okay to be scared, but don't be scared because of that. And so everyone who does, you know, anyone who's good at anything started somewhere and we all started at a absolutely, uh, square one. And so if you think that climbing might be something that's, you know, that's fun for you, um, stop taking the elevator, you know, stop taking the escalator. And so there's, there's a, you know, a thousand little steps you can take, uh, towards a goal that you have to just experience something and no one expects you to be the best at, at anything. And it takes a long time to be good at anything. And so, um, uh, don't, don't let the mag, you know, the, I guess the sheer size of, um, of something, you know, be scary. There's, if you stop and think about it, break it down, there's, a, there's, there's ways that you can get started. And so once you kind of set that in motion a little bit where you decide that you're not going to you know, take the escalator or the elevator more, you're going to, you're going to hit those stairs, then it begins to unlock, uh, so many other things and, and let those things get unlocked. Cool. And I guess that's a pretty good place to end it. You know, we'll, we'll end where we started with, uh, trying to make it to the next branch or the next rock outcrop before yeah. you uh, <laughs> exactly. start running again. <laughs> Kevin, it's been super fun talking. Uh, I'm glad we got to reconnect after a long time and, uh, you'll have to come out and run these marathons with me, I guess, cause, um, they're pretty good and there's a lot of I'm elevation and a lot of suffering. So I think they're up your alley. And I would like to do the one that has all the stops at the wineries at the wineries that's a good one yeah the wine trail is um definitely a nice one it, unfortunately <laughs> it's run in november so it's very hit or miss with the weather it's either really nice or horrible and raining so oh. yeah i guess you know there's also you know glory and benefit in that as well mm -hmm. cool listen thank kevin so it's been a great Jeff. time yeah thank you so much and uh we will talk again soon hopefully sounds good thank you jeff take care <laughs> Hey again, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed this interview with Kevin Tobin. Uh, I had a blast talking to him, and I know there was a couple of gems in there, so hope everybody got something good out of it. In the meantime, before you head off, before you head back to your life less common, your life less ordinary, I would love to ask for a favor. Uh, we have a brand new website. It's at livesofadventure.com that you can check us out on. And I would love for everybody to check that out. But more than that, I would love for you to just keep in the back of your mind the fact that we're going to be launching the show on iTunes in just a few weeks time. And we're going to need as many subscribers as we possibly can through iTunes. So in the next episode, I will be giving you some more details, but I just wanted to put that in the back of your mind so it stews away there until we see each other again. 
Looking forward to another interview soon. So talk to you soon and have a great time in the meantime. Bye-bye. 